Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and welcome to our uh, War in the Pacific Admirals Edition play-by-email game against XTRG. Uh, we're on to yet another day in this venerable conflict, which will cover the entire Second World War in the Pacific, uh, if we're ambitious anyway. And we are uh, moving into December 17th, 1941. Uh, it is a little bit less than two weeks into the war, we're ten days in, and we're looking at the combat result here for this day. Um, I don't really feel like a ton happened last turn, uh, but we'll see here what happens this turn. Um, so you can see here the turn's getting off to uh, some anti-submarine operations off uh, Mersing. The Japanese are uh, depth charging one of our Dutch submarines in the region. Uh, doesn't look like it hurt him at all. Um, there's some task forces merging here off Australia. Uh, and let's see if we can fast forward through this a little bit. Uh, we've got some nighttime bombing raids on Kota Baru. Uh, the real objective here is frankly just to fatigue out his, uh, his pilots here. If they're up all night because we're bombing them, uh, then it's going to lessen their, their efficiency when it comes to any kind of daytime missions, be it uh, naval bombing, because I think we spotted some GM-3 Nels, uh, or other things like that. So that's kind of what our Dutch bombers are doing based out of Sumatra. Some anti-submarine operations here off the coast of Singapore with our mine layers. Uh, and uh, let's see here. We're in the nighttime phase here, so there's kind of... Oh, oh goodness. Phew. All right, we have a troop transport that just left Fiji. It's heading toward Australia. They dropped off some troops on Fiji, and a Japanese submarine launched some torpedoes at them, but they failed to hit. Now, those troop transports have a reasonably high speed. I think they've got a task force speed of like 18 knots, uh, which makes them much more difficult for submarines to hit. If you've got transports in the 10 to 14 knot range, they're kind of sitting ducks because their cruising speed is going to be even less than that. But if you've got troop transports at 18 plus knots, they're much more difficult to hit, as is witnessed by that. Uh, torpedo strike that failed to do anything. Um, all right, so the Japanese are unloading on Tarawa. Uh, they've actually started to push south now toward Fiji, which is the main reason we're setting up that line of resistance between Fiji, Noumea, Suva, and Pago Pago. Meanwhile, there's a Japanese submarine here off the coast of uh, southern Australia here in this narrow strait that continues to sink some troop, or not troop transports, that continues to sink some transports. And a Japanese submarine also just put a torpedo into the transport Megs, or actually the AK, so the cargo ship Megs. Uh, so the Japanese submarines here uh, near Australia are doing quite a bit of damage. Frankly, I, I really need to get to get around to actually doing some anti-submarine work. I've tried to set up some of my air units to do anti-sub work, uh, but the uh, troop, the the the, sh the aircraft that I have, they're too short-legged to really be any effect, unfortunately. So I really need to do some ASW patrols, especially in that southern strait. Uh, but at this rate, you know, he might run out of torpedoes before uh, before I get anything into the into the region. All right, and uh, the assault on Singapore has begun. You can see here that the Japanese are flying 16 A6M20s uh, over. Actually, this isn't Singapore. This is over Johor Bahru. Interesting. So he's flying uh, fighter sweeps north of Singapore, actually. We're intercepting him with some of our own aircraft. And, uh, you know, we're fighting against zeros, so our odds are going to be pretty small. We're probably going to take some pretty heavy casualties here. Uh, this combat report just had one zero shot down. We lost four of our own aircraft. Four to one is not a terrible uh, ratio, but I'm kind of surprised. Um... I'm confused because uh, I don't think I had any cap over Johar Baru. I think I ordered them all over Singapore, although I suppose it looks like maybe our combat air patrol was ordered to, to head north. So this is a little bit weird. And also, I don't know why he's sweeping north unless this is somehow related to, um, you know, radar, maybe. Radar is di diverting them to intercept. I suppose that's an option. Um... Group patrol altitudes 20,000, scramble fighters to 16,000, raids overhead. Uh, looks like he did some Oscars sweeping here as well. Some additional Oscars sweeping through here. Nothing, you know, is, is up. We're sweeping over Bangkok. Some more zeros. Uh, looks like he's raiding just east of Canton with some sallies. And some more Oscars. So he's really getting getting his combat air patrol on here. 
I think we're going to have to respond on our side of the turn with really jacking up our combat air patrol because we only had 30% of our fighters up. We actually had a numerical advantage against the zeros, uh, but it might be interesting to uh, see if we can, you know, maybe get a little bit more uh, up. All right, so we did have some bombing raids here on Mersing. Some Hudsons and some Blenheims are bombing his troops here. Uh, we're hopefully going... I'm hoping my second brigade is going to arrive at Mersing and he's going to attack it and get kind of beat back, but we'll see how that all plays out. Meanwhile, we've got multiple bombing raids going against Mersing. I feel like this is the best use for the Allied bombers on the Dutch... Uh, or on the Malay Peninsula is just bombing uh, essentially his, um, his infantry there. Because you don't have a lot, like your bombers aren't going to do much against Japanese uh, shipping, uh, unless they're the torpedo bombers, the, the biplanes. But uh, everybody else is kind of pathetic against shipping, so uh, dropping payloads on land troops is a little bit less uh, less challenging, as you can see there. We did do a little bit of damage, a little bit of disruption, a few casualties, um, so hopefully that's uh, something we can continue to replicate. Hmm... Um. All right, so fast forwarding through here, we've got some dive bombers attacking Hankow, uh, doing some damage to the runway there. By the looks of it, we lost one damaged. Uh, meanwhile, some recon over a couple of different locations. He's also apparently flying some Bettys towards Singapore itself. Uh, I'm wondering if he's going to start bombing Singapore here this turn. Uh, by the looks of it, no. Um... It looks like he's bombing patrol ships. Okay, so he's bombing our minesweepers. I am more than happy to have him waste torpedoes against minesweepers. And actually, in this, the grand scheme of things, it looks like we shot down four beddies, damaged two. We only lost two buffaloes. So that's a very successful turn in my book. Um, okay. More torpedoes uh, flying here south of Fiji. No damage. I think this is going to be a pretty quiet turn. He landed on Tarawa. That's kind of a big development. There was some air combat over uh, Johor Bahru, which, again, I don't know why he's not sweeping Singapore. Um, some attacks in China here against the city. I'm surprised it didn't fall. Ooh, here we go. He's attacking at Mersing. Our 27th Australian Brigade did arrive in time. It's got a 98 combat value. And his 1st 124th Infantry Battalion and the Yosaka 2nd SNLEF uh, failed in their attack. Adjusted defense, 127. Adjusted attack, 21. So 1 to 6 odds in our favor. Uh, 400 Japanese casualties, 26 squads destroyed. That is a huge number of destroyed squads. F 24 disabled, 3 non-combat disabled. We lost 2 squads destroyed, 19 disabled. The disabled can, can recover, so that's good. The destroyed is where you get the victory points. So that's big that he lost 26 destroyed. We only lost 2. We did lose a, a few guns, a 4 disabled, 1 destroyed, 1 engineer squad uh, destroyed, 2 disabled. But overall, that's a very good result for us, and I wonder if maybe it's worth trying to see if we can counterattack next turn. Meanwhile, here we can see Tarawa fell. We didn't have any defenders on the island, so obviously that was expected uh, if he landed there. And then we're attacking at Sinyang with overwhelming force, and we took the base at Sinyang. So our first base that we retook in China. Unfortunately, it looks like the Japanese troops did feel like they had a, a route they could retreat, so it looks like they retreated west. Uh, but you can see here we, we inflicted two, 380 casualties, zero combat squads, I think were even in the hex, 29 non-combatants destroyed versus 9 disabled, 12 engineers destroyed, two vehicles lost, one unit retreated. Oh, one of the two units was destroyed, so he had two units there. Uh, looks like we destroyed one of them. Uh, I'm not sure which one. I don't think it tells me, but he had a road construction company and a Air Force company, uh, a Japanese Army Air Force sort of support company. We lost 22 casualties, so basically big victory there for us uh, in, in Xinjiang. Um, meanwhile, we're continuing to bombard the Japanese at Ichang. We can see here they've got about 500 combat value at this, uh, at this city, and we'll have to see what we're going to do there. I'd like to wrap this sort of siege, if you will, up at Ichang, uh, but I'm not sure if we have sufficient force in the region yet. Meanwhile, we launched a shock attack at Pao Tau. We have a lot more assault value here, but the adjusted defense versus assault didn't play out for us. It's got a fort there. 
So we they lost 80 casualties. We lost 179, although no destroyed units. So that was uh, a positive result there. And I think that's going to do it for this turn, I'm guessing. We can see some units are expanding their forts, but it's going to kick me out of the save, so I'll pull up my mid-turn save here and update you guys with where I'm at uh, in just a moment. I'm also really confused why he continues to, why he's sweeping over Joe Harbor. I wonder if that was a mistake. All right, we're back, and I've actually completed, I think, most of my turn, but let's take a quick look at the combat results. So I know we had some air-to-air -air combat that was occurring on the Malay Peninsula last turn, and uh, if we take a look here at the combat results, we see 10 air-to-air -air losses on our own. We're claiming 10 Japanese air-to-air -air losses. Uh, nothing destroyed on the ground. Uh, three Japanese aircraft destroyed by flak. 10 Japanese aircraft destroyed in operational losses, only one allied unit. So if we go ahead and we take a look at the aircraft losses here, what we're claiming is last turn, we're claiming 9 enemy zeros destroyed, 4 in air-to-air -air combat, 5 in operational losses. If that's true, that's that's pretty big. I mean, if we can impact his, his forces over Malay and, you know, give him 10 uh, zeros lost per turn, I think that's going to be hard for him to come back from. I mean... Just scaling it out, 10 per turn, is over 270 aircraft in a given month, and I don't think he produces anything near that. I think he produces like 50 or 60 zeros per month at the start of the war. Obviously, he ramp it, ramps that up pretty heavily, but still, that's uh, not a small, uh, small number. Uh, additionally, we're still claiming he's lost over 90 zeros since the start of the war just 10 days ago. Uh, and I think part of that's due to the massive losses he had over Pearl Harbor, uh, at least according to our intelligence. That gets updated over time, but uh, that's what we're claiming right now anyway. In addition to that, we're claiming seven uh, GM or G4M1 Bettys destroyed. These are the very fine medium-range torpedo bomber or level bombers that were going after our mine layers or uh, mine sweepers near Singapore. That was really a coup to be able to destroy that. We did lose six Buffaloes. We did lose three uh, of the P40 uh, Flying Tiger variants. We also lost two P-40 Warhawks, so we did lose some quality aircraft, five really quality aircraft and six of the crappy uh, uh, Buffaloes. If we took a look at the actual pilot losses, we only lost one pilot killed in action, however. So despite the fact that we lost 11 modern aircraft, only one of our pilots was killed, three wounded, no missing. So that's good because while... Airframes are hard to come by early in the war for the Allies. We do have some in reserve. If we take a look at the actual uh, Buffaloes that we have over here, we have... Where do we go here? Ah, I can't click on things. Uh, if we take a look at the Buffaloes here, while we don't really have much in the way of P-40s in reserve, we do have 40 aircraft in the pool for the Buffalo. So theoretically, we'll be able to pull reinforcements for the Buffalo at least for a little while, as long as those pilots stay, you know, up to tippy-top shape, uh, we should be able to fight, I wouldn't say a war of attrition, but at least uh, be able to maintain ourselves here. You'll see here, last turn we had a total of like 68 aircraft that were ready for combat. This number's dropped down to 58, and actually it was 50 at the start of this turn. I moved additional aircraft that were in uh, on the island of Borneo here. Uh, over uh, that were transiting from the Philippines. So we got eight more aircraft into the theater uh, ready for combat. Uh, that brings our total to 58 ready uh, after having 68 last turn. Uh, the good thing is the ones we're replacing uh, are bringing in our high-quality P-40 Warhawks. So that's good. Uh, not anywhere near the match of the Japanese Zero, but certainly still uh, better than, than, you know, the Buffalo for sure. You can see here the H-81A3s, the Flying Tigers, suffered pretty heavily, even if they didn't suffer heavily in terms of killed. I mean, they, they lost three planes, but uh, nine of their 21 aircraft are currently under repair. Uh, they're currently damaged. If we take a look at the... Whoops, not that. If we take a look at the aircraft themselves, uh, none of these look like they're going to be ready. Well, one of them will be ready tomorrow. The rest have multi-day repairs. They all suffered some pretty heavy damage in their combat with the Japanese Zeros. So this is going to be a bit of a, a challenge for us to overcome, is uh, the ability to keep these aircraft up and running. For that very reason, I'm actually going to stand down this entire squadron. So the hope is we get that one aircraft back tomorrow. We get 13 aircraft, and then we can see where we go from there. 
Uh, additionally, the P-40s that I flew in, I'm also going to stand those down. I'm going to stand these P-40 Warhawks down, which fought yesterday. Likewise, three, four, and six-day delays in terms of being ready for uh, combat again. Uh, heavy damage. So obviously, they survived. The P-40s are rugged aircraft, but they did take a bit of a punishment. So the, the pilots are okay, the planes are okay, uh, but they're going to take a little while before they're ready to fly again, which is, that's a problem. Um, the buffaloes here fared a little bit better. You know, we just we had we had several that were destroyed. Uh, we had some aircraft in reserve, so we slotted those back over. The 488 squadron suffered the worst in terms of aircraft-wise. It has six aircraft damage. Two of those will be ready tomorrow, and then the others are going to take like the better part of a week before they're ready to fly again. So, pretty heavy attrition on our air forces this turn. I'm actually going to stand down all my P40s. I'm going to stand down the uh, the um, Flying Tigers, and I'm going to stand down one of the three Buffalo Squadrons. I am going to up the Cap Patrol from the other two Buffalo Squadrons, so really we're probably going to have like 15 Buffaloes on Cap over Singapore. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to shorten the range that these guys are allowed to fly out to down to zero. Uh, that's because if you take a look at last turn's combat results, what you'll actually see is the Japanese didn't fly fighter sweeps over Singapore at all. They didn't make any play on the airbase at Singapore. I don't want my pilots flying off and straying to and fro. We need to keep a very close lid on our aircraft. We need to keep a very close lid on our pilots. We need to make sure that we're not getting drawn into engagements that don't favor us. And one of the things that will result in that is if you have a cap over Singapore, but some of them get directed out here, then you might have 60 aircraft up on a combat air patrol. Maybe only 10 of them leak out over toward Johor Bahru. And then if he's going, if he's going there, it makes it a lot easier for him to have a numerical advantage. He didn't have a numerical advantage last turn, but the point remains, if we get drawn out over Johar Bru, we're lucky that we didn't suffer worse. He had like 40 Oscars that were flying sweeps over this base as well, and um, as far as we could tell, our aircraft didn't intercept them, but they didn't intercept the Zeros, and again, we, we I think we had a good turn, but I don't think that's something I want to do regularly. The entire point of this combat air patrol over Singapore is to keep the vital runways and air, aircraft at Singapore in flying shape. The base at Johar Bahru is a nice alternate. It has uh, air capacity of four, but I don't have anywhere near enough aviation support there for us to be able to really fly out of there. And frankly, uh, I don't have the resources to defend two bases very heavily at once. Uh, there, there's potentially a desire to disperse my aircraft, uh, but not after last turn when I only have 50 that are ready. In addition to that, to try and keep the combat air patrol over Singapore going, I have a very light, uh, each of these three Dutch squadrons here uh, at Dejambi is going to fly a 20% uh, patrol to Singapore. It's going to be set to a max of four so they don't leave, they just go over Singapore itself. But these guys here, you know, an extra six or seven aircraft are going to be added to the combat air patrol over Singapore. These are basically Dutch uh, Buffalo aircraft right here. Um, so they're going to be flying over that way as well. And frankly, I don't really want to commit them or show my hand there. But one of the reasons I am committing them is I've got a lot of pilots in here that are losing their experience. It's kind of dropping a bit because they haven't had enough uh, things to do yet. So I need to keep them flying, even if I don't really particularly want to send them into combat. I've also moved to 20 additional Dutch fighters, Hawks and Demons, up here to Palembang. So we now have 20 fighters at Palembang. We have 30 fighters at Dijambi. That's 50 Dutch fighters here on the island of Sumatra. And then we have about 60 uh, fighters at Singapore ready for action. So it's about 110 potential aircraft if we needed to surge our combat air patrol. I think, and I could be wrong, but if uh, the Philippines is any lesson... Uh, what he did at the Philippines initially was he first tried to shut down Clark Field and Manila with large-scale bombing raids. He lost a lot of Betty bombers doing that because he didn't knock my Air Force out first. He learned from that mistake, and then what he did was he followed those bombing raids up with three or four days of heavy sweeps with large numbers of zeros. And that was sort of his, his strategy, was just overwhelm the defenses. you got to send the combat air patrols up overwhelm them, destroy them in the air, and then mop up with bombers afterwards. I get the sense he may do that with Singapore. So that's why I'm kind of scaling back my combat air patrol because I don't want to get into a war of attrition with him. My aircraft are inferior. 
Uh, his pilots are superior, so we would not fare well in that conflict. So my plan is to scale back the cap a little bit until we have some indications that he's actually going to start bombing Singapore, at which point we'll need to go all out to try and defend ourselves because we can't afford these runways to get shut down. Uh, one other piece I will, ha will add is that uh, I am... Uh, and the one bombing raid he did launch was against our, our ships here uh, that are kind of in anti-submarine patrol status. So it wasn't really a raid. Sorry, what I mean by that, it wasn't really a raid against Singapore itself. It was against the shipping in, nearby. So the other reason I'm not completely standing down my cap is, one, it's just too risky to not have anything in the air if he's going to bomb us because that would be a free reign on the airfield. But two is because if I can, you know, damage his bombers a bit more, if he's going to send more off and uh, sort of anti-shipping raids and, and they, they get hit by our fighters and maybe given a bloody nose, maybe he'll reconsider that naval strike role. Maybe he'll take his bombers and say, listen, I don't really want them flying and getting shot down when there's no ships in the area that are worth the fuel. I'll switch them over to naval bombing. And then that might give me an opportunity to have the Prince of Wales try and escape. Speaking of the Prince of Wales and speaking of trying to escape, I am no longer repairing the Prince of Wales at Singapore. Uh, I am shifting the Prince of Wales over uh, to ready status, and we are going to make a dash for it. She can only make eight knots. I really, frankly, should have just tried to get her out of there when she first was damaged rather than fall back to Singapore. Sorry for the weird graphical distortion here. But our repairs have gotten us up to eight knots uh, with a four-knot cruising speed. So that's about double the speed that she entered Singapore at. It should make her more difficult for submarines to find, but eight knots is still pretty slow. It's slower than a slow merchant. So she's going to be a bit of a sitting duck, and really we're going to have to pray that our escorts do a good job of clearing the sea in front of her to prevent any submarines from really getting at her. In addition to, frankly, like one torpedo from a GM-3 or GM-4 probably will finish her off. With that being said, my order for her to return to active status is going to take three days to uh, accomplish. So we can't escape with Prince of Wales yet. We've got to be. We've got to wait for her to be made ready for sea. That's going to take three days. That's the other reason I'm standing my combat air patrol down uh, to a certain extent is because I'm going to try and surge those aircraft out against the Japanese when the Prince of Wales retreats. So when the Prince of Wales leaves port, we're going to try and have 40 or 50 aircraft over her at all time. We're going to have everybody set to 100% long-range cap, and we're going to see if we can get out there. The challenge is going to be she's not going to be able to get out of range in one day. It's probably going to be, let's see here, one day probably gets her to here, two days probably gets her to here, three days probably gets her to here. I think the Japanese air cover ends right around Banka, so I think it's going to take about three days to get out of enemy enemy aircraft range uh, from their bases at Kotobaru. And that's assuming he doesn't bring these carriers down. So you can see here we're, we've spotted enemy carriers. They're light carriers based on our uh, reconnaissance flights from our P PBYs. But we've sighted multiple enemy carriers, 44 fighters, 18 auxiliaries. So I don't think it's a fleet carrier force. I don't know what the auxiliaries are. I'm guessing maybe those are like search planes within the task force. It's weird that I don't see any bombers here. But at least initially the report is that a pretty heavy enemy fighter force also surface assets here as well. That's the other reason we're getting moving. Because frankly, if he's going to bring these carriers in, he may wipe out our air cover over Singapore. And then it's just going to be a question of whether the subs or the bombers get her. So we'll stand down. Then we'll be two days away. We'll see where we're at. If he continues not bombing us, maybe we'll say stay stood down for one more turn, and then we'll have you know three or four days of heavy air fighting as we try and get the, the Prince of Wales out. That's an optimistic look at things. I think Prince of Wales is already dead. I don't think an eight-knot ship's going to make it past these subs. He's already sunk a bunch of our ships with submarines, uh, even just this last turn. If we go just the last turn, we lost another uh, ship here uh, near sail uh, to a submarine. And we also nearly lost the Coolidge, which was a, a troop transport that had already dropped her troops off on Fiji uh, from him, uh, from submarines. And we also had a torpedo go in the MiGs, which is a, uh, what is that, a U.S. Navy transport, uh, an AKL, a cargo ship, uh, a pretty decent ship too. Uh, but she's, I think she'll make it to, to Brisbane, but, we'll, but she did take a torpedo. So it's worth calling out. Meanwhile, our reinforcements for Fiji are approaching. Uh, we've got our first task force here, uh, which is bringing the 7th Australian Infantry Brigade into Suva. 
Uh, in addition to that, we have the uh, 9th Australian Infantry Brigade uh, heading toward Nadi. And then we've got the, uh, we have, what is this, the 4th Australian Infantry Brigade heading for Suva. So we're sending three infantry brigades to Fiji uh, to really buff this up. Uh, and then I've got some American units. I've got the 8th Inf uh, Marine Regiment is going to Pago Pago. The 120th U.S. Army Regiment is going to Savi, and both those units are basically the strength of, like, two Australian infantry brigades. So, um, you know, you can say, why are you putting four brigades on Fiji? Well, one, there's two bases, and two, it takes two of those units to equal one of the equivalent American units. So we're putting four brigades into Fiji. We're putting a regiment into Pago Pago, a regiment into Savi. And then I've also started railing around some troops so that we can put some reinforcements into Nomaya as well uh, to strengthen the force there. This is free French troops. Nomaya is definitely an ideal target for the Japanese. We may need to try and defend Komak as well. Um, but that's kind of my thought. And I'm really a little bit more urgent now that we know that he just took Tarawa, so he started moving south. We'll see if he starts moving toward Ocean Island or Nehru, where we've got some float pl planes that are kind of trying to keep an eye on the area. Um, but I think we'll just have to kind of see how things play out. We don't really have an ability to have a great uh, view of what's going on from a... Um, from a search plane perspective because we just don't have enough PVYs down here. So I'm not picking anything up over this way. I might as well move my search aircraft over just a little bit just to see what happens here. I've only got one Catalina flying out of uh, Savi. But we'll kind of move it over a little. We had him over Canton. We didn't see anything in Canton, so we're moving him over a little bit this way. Um, Coast Watchers would be nice too. Uh, these guys over here, doesn't really look like we're picking up anything near Kwajalein, which is interesting. Uh, maybe we can shift these guys south a bit and see what's over here. Well, maybe we'll do this. I'd like to keep as, as much continuous coverage as possible, but also not a ton of overlap. All right, so that's the situation there. I'm doing some anti-submarine uh, patrols here around Fiji. You can see we've got a lot of air coming out of Fiji. Um, and I, I haven't really seen much around here, but he's obviously torpedoing a lot of ships. Uh, so there's that that we need to think about. Again, we've got some anti-submarine patrols kind of going off Australia, but the ships, frankly, have a really short range, so it's hard for them to be terribly effective. Um, the Repulse is on her way back to South America, or to South Africa. Uh, she has re replenished, so she met up with this uh, oiler task force here, which used up about four, about a little bit more than half of its oil here, these small Dutch uh, oilers. We're going to send them up to Oosthaven to replenish their, their stock and maybe head them down to Perth. Uh, but in addition to that, the repulse here, you can see she's doing okay. Her float damage is dropping a little bit, uh, and she's on her way back to Cape Town uh, with a cruising speed, uh, well, the flank speed's 14 knots, the cruising speed's 8. So uh, she's on her way. Slowly but surely, she'll head back to uh, Cape Town. Hopefully she's safe at this point, and we can get her back. Um, the Ignore these box, the, the range here. I replenished them, so they used a lot of their op points. In addition to that, we've got a heavy cruiser task force here that's going to set sail with Rear Admiral Wooten. Uh, he's a slightly less aggressive, but he's a very good leader, good inspiration, good naval score. He's just a little bit less aggressive than the Admiral we sent in charge of Mersing. Uh, so if we look here, uh, I believe we sent, well, I don't see anyone, I don't see the guy's name, but we sent some other uh, Amer or British Admiral who had like a level 81 aggression. Uh, and he was actually the best naval rated British commander. Uh, but we, we sent, um, why is this different? I don't have political points to do that. But then anyway, uh, so we picked Wooten because he's a little bit less aggressive. Uh, the intent here is these heavy cruisers, this task force actually has pretty decent uh, anti-aircraft, 2,900 anti-aircraft score. Uh, and you can see here we've got two heavy cruisers. We've put together a force of, what is that, five light cruisers, two heavy cruisers, and six destroyers. And what we're going to do is we're going to send these guys up here toward Billiton. Again, I think his uh, bombing radius is right around here. So uh, what I'm going and I don't think he can carry, I don't know if he can carry a torpedo out to max range anyway, but I'm going to have the surface task force kind of sit around Billiton. That's kind of my goal, just kind of have these guys uh, sort of go up here, remain on station, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and 
I really hope they're still out of range. Uh, what they're going to do is they're going to just hang out here, and then once the Prince of Wales starts making an escape, these guys are going to dash north to provide some combat uh, screening for the Prince of Wales. In the event that the Japanese send any surface task forces down here into this straight into this slot, uh, we'll have a, a task force, a moderately strong task force. Certainly, you know, if he's got like 10 heavy cruisers, or I think we saw like five or six heavy cruisers before. If he's still got that force there, these guys are going to get overwhelmed. But they might get some licks in. They might, at the very least, take some heat off the battleship and maybe let it get away, uh, which will be their primary object objective. Additionally, I might shear off one or two destroyers to fatten up the destroyer escort for the battleship. I'm also sending two destroyers north from Palembang. Uh, one of them, no, actually, they're, and neither of them are great anti-submarine warfare destroyers, but we're going to send them north to Singapore, where, so that way we'll have six destroyers at Singapore to escort the Prince of Wales south. Again, I've got a sense that the Prince of Wales is going to get sunk no matter what, but I don't want to just give up. I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can uh, in order to, uh, you know, do what we can to get her out of there. Uh, in addition to that, we're moving some aircraft around, uh, trying to pull more aircraft out of the Philippines uh, and strengthen up Singapore. So, you know, if we're losing five or six aircraft in Singapore a day, at least for the next three or four days, I should be able to supply replacements for that uh, since I'm pulling everything I can out of the Philippines. Additionally, I have a uh, the first Phil 71st Filipino Infantry Division and the 194th uh, Tank Battalion have arrived at Batangas as a blocking force. The 1st Filipino Infantry Division also just arrived in Manila. It will act as a blocking force as well. Uh, Manila is generating, because of its industry, Manila is generating supplies for us. So as much as many supplies as I can build up here, the better, because we're going to need to suck that all into uh, Batana. We kind of already have uh, as best we can. So that's the objective there. The uh, Filipino Aviation Engineer Unit arrived at Ilba to try and help get our 12 Warhawks here that are not uh, ready uh, out. Uh, you can see here a bunch of them should be ready to move next turn. They're just, you know, there's a delay of one turn. Um, I don't know if we'll get the whole squad or not, but that's quite a few intact P-40s that I'd like to try and get out of there as, if we can. Um, and get over to Singapore because it'd be great to throw 12 more P-40s into the air against his uh, his force. So I think there's going to be a really large air battle shaping up over Singapore. Feels like he's really withdrawn a lot of his air forces around uh, the Phil around the Philippines as well. Uh, I've got a couple infantry battalions there. Again, these are more blocking forces to delay the enemy. We're not really building up much in the way of defenses at Clark Field. We'll have some, uh, but we're moving a lot of our units uh, away from Clark Field. I had originally d attempted to build some fortifications there, but they were building, frankly, too slow, and they were eating up valuable supply. Unfortunately, I just don't think the Philippines realistically is a, is a place you can have two strong defensive positions, uh, you know, to, to try and bleed the Japanese dry. I just... My experience, I don't think that's terribly realistic. So, uh, it, you know, we, we decided not to do that. Um, maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's a mistake. But I'm, I'm content just kind of pulling back into, into Bataan, and we'll see if he, uh, how aggressively he comes at us. But I think we can hold out for a while. Um, I've got, I'm leaving a couple of forces here at Clark Field as kind of a blocking force. Uh, probably shouldn't leave this infantry regiment here. I'd rather leave more Philippine troops um, the, the American unit quality is pretty high, so I want to make sure that they're not bloodied and then unable to defend Bataan. So we're going to leave maybe like 100 or so. Com You've got 89 here from the 1st Filipino Constabulary Regiment. That is a Filipino unit, right? Yeah. Uh, and then we've got 82 here from the 57th uh, Filipino Infantry uh, Regimental Combat Team. Um, so we've got, you know, like what is that, 160 between the two attack value, another 40 up here from a, a Filipino Cavalry Regiment. You know, we'll have about 100 and 120, uh, sorry, actually over 220 combat value, while the majority of our troops, these Filipino Infantry Divisions, are falling back uh, into uh, Bataan. Bataan is about to level up its uh, fortifications here to level 3, so it's up to 89. So again, hopefully we can build that up as, as much as possible for, before the Japanese arrived. That's why we've got some of these blocking forces in place, is to make him slow down or think about some things a little bit uh, before uh, 
before we're pushed in there. Speaking of fortifications here, if we go over to Singapore, uh, what is it currently at? It is at level two, about to be level three. Uh, it's Singapore, however, we are having sort of, of a forward defense at Johar Bahru. We're about to get to level two fortifications there. And I think that's really important because we don't have the same uh, combat value there as we do in the Philippines. The Philippines is a lot more, more combat power. Uh, so you can see here the 51st, that's not moving, right? Yeah, so already in uh, in Bataan, we've got a garrison with 500 combat value, which doesn't sound like a lot, but 500 combat value in Bataan. Uh, if we take a look at Clark Field, Clark Field has 900, and the majority of that's falling back. So that's 1,400 between the two. Additionally, we've got like another 140 up here. Some of that will fall back. We've got another 130 at... Uh, Manila, and uh, if you if you factor all that in, that's a reasonably strong force uh, that uh, that we have in place. You know, you're talking over 1,600 combat value. When you compare that to Singapore, we've got 414 uh, troops uh, in Singapore in terms of the combat value, and that so not very much. That's like maybe one Japanese infantry division. And then we have 355 in Johar Baru, and that's really the majority of it. We've got like 200 more in brigades up here in the north of Manila that we're trying to fall back. Uh, but between the two, we might only have 1,000 combat value, which makes it really important to build up a more of a, a defense in depth. And while we can't defend forward up here, we just don't have the resources to do it. We'll get chewed up, and by the time we get back here, we'll be a broken force that won't be able to, you know. Basically, it'll be like the real Battle of Singapore, where the British were so chewed up up here and demoralized, they didn't put much of a fight up at Singapore. I'd rather be in a good position to, you know, resist down here for a couple weeks uh, in sort of a, a corregidor type of a stand. So anyway, that's the situation right now, mostly around Singapore and the Philippines. Um, our carriers are waiting for some refueling here to the south of Hawaii. We haven't seen any enemy submarines down this far south. Uh, shielding some of these troops that are on their way to Suva. Uh, this is actually a couple of, we've got a dive bomber and a fighter squadron, as well as the U.S. Air Force Base Force uh, heading to uh, Fiji as well. We've got our three carriers that are going to go that direction, but they're going to about to get some refuel uh, from Neosho and Rampo. Uh, they need some additional fuel. Uh, frankly, I'm, this should be Operation Sho Shoestring because I don't have the resources in place yet. I've got a lot of convoys on the way, but I don't have the resources in place yet. I also did just drop the uh, AVD, so Destroyer Tender Childs, put 170 supply into Bataan uh, in a sort of a Tokyo Express uh, sprint run. We're going to do the same thing with this uh, PG Surabaya, but it's out of fuel, so uh, it's taking some pretty heavy system damage. We're trying to get it to uh, Sakadin so we can refuel it and then head it toward uh, Bataan. Uh, we're also fueling up kind of a suicide squad of uh, three light transports uh, that are going to try and see if they can sneak into Bataan with another 5,000 supply. Again, anything we can do to maximize our defense of the islands. It feels like he's pulled a lot of his air out. Uh, a lot of his bombers out anyway. Uh, and if that's the case, then the more we can, you know, sneak in and make him pay for that, the better. Meanwhile, at Ichang, we're actually going to go ahead and uh, launch a deliberate attack. I think he's got around 500 combat value. We're up to 1,300. Uh, and, you know, that could grow a little bit more. We've got about 400 uh, combat value in the 59th Chinese Corps, which could arrive, but I'm not going to do a shock attack. I'm just going to do a deliberate attack, so it shouldn't really, you know, destroy our units to see how strong his troops still are uh, in Di Chang. Um, so that's the goal there. Um, meanwhile, we did take Xinyang with a pretty heavy force, about uh, 1,500. I think that's our largest army in China. We're going to move uh, a large number of these troops west to uh, secure our defense of Xinjiang by driving these Chinese or these Japanese forces back, maybe, or defending to the west of Xinjiang. I'm not sure what he has here, but I don't really have a ton of supply in Xinjiang. I have more over here, so I'm going to see if I can push him back and maybe threaten Hankou. I, again, I don't, I don't really know what he has in place, but if I can drive south toward Hankou and Wuchang and destroy both these cities, uh, I think that'll really help us in the Chinese conflict. Cheng Kao uh, may be in some trouble. He's building up some strength here just to the northeast of Cheng Kao, so I'm not sure. You know, he's got 16,000 troops. We don't have a huge force arrayed against him uh, there, so, you know, the other alternative is railing these troops from Xinjiang back 
uh, to Chen Cao, but then, I, then I'm dealing with my own double envelopment. I'd rather threaten to double envelop him here by moving south and north, because uh, that's the other thing I'm going to actually do here, is these, these troops are all going to move north, uh, and they're going to sort of link up here and then move on uh, Wu Chang. If I can move on Wu Chang and Hang, Hang Cao from two different directions, maybe he'll split his forces and be able to be destroyed. Um, again, Cheng Chao is important for us to hold, but it's also one of those things that it's going to be very difficult for us to do so if he if he's massing all of his troops here. And I hope maybe he'll maybe he'll panic, maybe he'll pull some troops out. I don't know, but uh, I don't really have a lot. I just don't have a lot I can do. The good thing is Cheng Chao is a level two fort. Uh, it's building up to level three, so that should help. Uh, it has 600 garrisons, so he'd really have to bring a pretty strong force against it to overwhelm it. Uh, we have additional reinforcements on the way, another 200 here, which will bring it up to 800. Uh, are these guys moving that way too? No, these are moving to Luoyang. So that'll bring it up to 800. I think I'm moving some troops from Luoyang over there as well. Yeah, actually I am. So I'm moving uh, an additional 600, 700, uh, but the 200 over here, 900. So we're going to have about 1,500 combat value at Chiang Kao, plus whatever of this uh, force doesn't get destroyed by the Japanese as they build their forces up. Potentially, we could have as much as 2,000 combat value in a reasonably defensible position. Uh, it's just a question of whether we can supply those troops there, too. That's another uh, big question mark. Um, let's move these guys. We don't need that much up north. Uh, these guys are in Cyan. We'll try and move into Chiang Kao as well. I don't really know if he's making his big play for Chiang Kao. It's just, you know, we see him building up 16,000 troops in the in the adjacent hex. So it's it's a it's a bit of a concern. I don't know what he has here either. Kind of tempted to kind of feel him out, move this Chinese core to the east here to whatever that city name is. I'm playing a pretty aggressive China, which may come back and bite me, and we may get steamrolled, but. I'd like to inflict as many casualties as I can. Uh, we've moved the Flying Tigers forward. They're going to do a combat air patrol. We saw some unescorted bombers hitting here, so we'll see if we can we can do that. They're going to be on pretty uh, pretty fatigued, so they're at 37, so this is probably a one-turn only thing. Um, that may be ill-advised, but uh, we're doing it. We're doing it anyway. Uh, these guys, meanwhile, are going to do a very small combat air patrol. Uh, I don't want to do it over Singyang. I'd rather do it over here. Although they're just going to do a small combat. These guys have a 30 fatigue as well uh, at Chen Kao. So I'm just going to try and rest these guys and hopefully he doesn't bomb Chen Kao. Uh, meanwhile, we tried to attack up north here near Patao. Didn't really work, but our unit there actually didn't suffer that many casualties. It was like 400 casualties, but very few units actually destroyed. So we're going to hang out there till our additional core arrives from the east. Uh, additionally, the third provincial core is on its way from pa to Patao as well. I think we're getting penalized for not having... Oh, no, we do have enough garrison. We just don't have supplies here. So if we need to take Pao Tao so we can free up this supply line with Lang Kao. Uh, otherwise, these guys are going to be kind of screwed with no direct supply line. So we really need to, to eliminate these two Japanese units up here. Um, but yeah, so deliberate attack at Chang. We'll see how that plays out. I'm also sending two additional brigades to Mersing. I'd really like to throw these Japanese units into the sea and destroy them. So I'm going to do a deliberate attack at uh, Marising. We saw the enemy attack us at Marising last turn and fail, and they lost 26 infantry squads destroyed. So I'm hoping that maybe if I have a cautious attack, we can feel out if there's still any heart in the enemy resistance here or if maybe we can overwhelm them next turn. Of course, he may fast transport in additional reinforcements, and this may turn into a piecemeal you know, slog fest of like, like Guadalcanal. I don't know. We'll see. Um, additionally, we've got one more destroyer over here, the Express, which is badly damaged. We're going to send her uh, to join the uh, the uh, Repulse as she uh, pulls back to South Africa. And I think that's our turn. I don't really have a lot else to say. Um, you know, we did well last turn in, in enemy aircraft destroyed. We didn't lose too many ourselves. We've got like 100,000 fuel out here in various convoys. That's going to be going back to Perth, which will help fuel the Australian economy. Additionally, I think we're putting like 20,000 fuel into Darwin so it can operate as sort of a northern base. You can see the first 1,800 of it is about to arrive. Um, I think Midway is about to get attacked. If we go over here to Midway, we can see we've, we picked up an enemy task force moving east. APDs, which are transports, probably moving into Midway. We've got our submarines converging. But either he's going to land on Midway next turn on the, on the 
the turn of the 18th or in the 19th. And I think we'll probably lose the island. I pulled out all but two of my Catalinas. Uh, I left the other two just so we can see if we discover any other enemy ships. The last thing we saw like four or five days ago was the carrier group moving north. So my assumption it was to support these guys. So I'm assuming the carriers are still over here, which is good because, you know, the, the longer the carriers are out east, the more time that gives us to suck as much fuel out of the Dutch East Indies as possible, deny it to the Japanese when they do arrive. And uh, that's, you know, seems like a silly goal, but uh, fueling uh, Australia's economy is challenging, bringing enough fuel to bear. And these are really short routes to Australia, so we can really kind of ho hopefully jumpstart Australia's economy and start pumping out supply for us to... Uh, for us to use. Uh, where are these? This guy's damaged. All right. Uh, so Balkapin, he's going to get a good deal of fuel. It's like 47,000 uh, right there, and it's a good oil producing facility, 300, 300 refinery. Sora Urbaya, however, we've like, it's got a good deal of oil uh, and refineries. Uh, Batavia and, and some of these other places here have actually good industry, but we've actually pulled all but like 20,000 fuel out of, uh, out of Java. That's nice. But what we haven't pulled a lot out of is Palembang yet. We pulled like 20,000 out, but it's this is the biggest oil field on the map. I think it is 900 at Palembang with like a refinery of 12 or over 1,000. So that's the really big uh, oil producing facility. Palembang was known as sort of the, the biggest of the oil uh, fields in uh, in the Dutch East Indies. There's another one at Dam Dajama, and this fuel flows down here via these roads as well. Um, so basically that's the key one. I'm going to try and suck some of that fuel out here at Osthaven. I'm going to bring a couple of tankers up here. It only has 17,000. It's a smaller port, but it's linked by rail to Palembang. So they should, so it should pull, uh, fuel out of Palembang into Oosthaven. Uh, and that way we're further removed from any Japanese air attacks because we're further south. Um, and again, sort of a scorched earth type policy. I don't have any way to like blow stuff up right now. Uh, but it is what it is. He's also arrived at Oloa Star, which is a level 4 airfield, but it's not any further south than Kota Baru. So it gives him another area to base his aircraft, but it doesn't actually get him any closer to our shipping lanes. So I'm not as worried about that. And that's the situation right now, guys. Um, that's what I'm doing. That's what we're looking forward to as this turn comes to a close. And that's what I'll leave you guys with. So I hope you guys all have a great day. Hope you're enjoying the series as always. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching. And I'm out.